Now, there are two agents that we are missing in immunotherapy, which is plasmapheresis and IVIG. As I said, these are extremely effective modalities of immunosuppression. Therefore, we resort to them whenever we need a rapid improvement. So, when is rapid improvement required in myasthenic patients? In patients with severe or difficult to treat myasthenia gravis, in patients with myasthenic crisis, and in a myasthenic patient before surgery, most often what is the surgery that these patients are going to undergo? It is going to be thymectomy. So, pre-thymectomy, these patients may require plasma pheresis and IVIG, particularly if there is a severe weakness. Now, plasma pheresis, what is the dose of plasma pheresis that is recommended in myasthenia gravis? Usually, 5 exchanges, 5, 3 to 4 liters exchanges. So, 3 to 4 liter per exchange. Five such exchanges done over 10 to 14 days is the usual dose prescribed. IVIG is given at a total dose of 2 gram per kg and it is split over about 3 to 5 days. So, this is how plasma pheresis and IVIG helps in expediting recovery. Now, what other newer treatments are available or being investigated for myasthenia gravis? These are the FCRN blockers. Now, FCRN blockers are a new category of agents. First of all, what is FCRN? FCRN is fragment crystallized neonatal receptors. So, fragment crystallized neonatal receptors are basically molecules which bind to these autoantibodies and protect these antibodies. They prevent lysosomal degradation of the antibodies. So, basically they prolong the stability and the shelf life of these antibodies. So, they are not very useful in patients with these autoimmune diseases like myasthenia gravis. So, here what have we tried? We have tried to block these protectors of these antibodies. So, these auto antibodies are protected by FCRN we have tried to create drugs which are going to block these FCR. So, these receptors when they are blocked, what happens? These antibodies become more susceptible to lysosomal degradation. So, more of these antibodies are going to be degraded and that results in reduction in the levels of these antibodies which translates into increase in the level of the acetylcholine receptors and hence better neuromuscular transmission. So, studies have shown that use of these agents have caused significant reduction in the levels of these autoantibodies. So, the acetylcholine receptor antibodies reduced by about 60 to 85 percent as early as 1 to 3 months from the time of use of these agents. So, these are a new category of agents which are currently being investigated, FCRN blockers. So, fragment crystallized neonatal receptor blockers. So, what is the role of thymectomy? Having understood about all the pharmacological options which are available for patients with myasthenia gravis, this is a surgical option which is available. As I said, thymectomy for myasthenia gravis is understood from two standpoints. From one point, when we diagnose a patient with thymoma, then definitely because uh, although it may be benign, because local spread is a definite possibility, surgery is warranted in these patients. The second point of view is in a non thymomatous patients, particularly in generalized acetylcholine receptor antibody positive myasthenia gravis, studies have shown that thymectomy in this subgroup of patients, so non thymomatous acetylcholine receptor antibody positive generalized myasthenia gravis. So, only in this small subgroup group of patients, thymectomy has been shown to bring about clinical improvement. It reduces the need for steroids, it reduces the need for immunosuppressive treatment, it reduces the need for hospitalization. But what is most important, remember pre-thymectomy will have to do a forced vital capacity and make sure that there is no respiratory weakness. If there is respiratory weakness, if the patient is inching towards myasthenic fatigue, then the patients may require a faster form of immunotherapy, something like plasma pheresis or IVIG pre thymectomy. So, pre thymectomy evaluation and consideration for plasma pheresis or IVIG is very important. Second most important consideration before thymectomy is are there any uh, counterproductive factors? So, who are the groups of patients in whom we will not prefer thymectomy? So, as I said, uh, acetylcholine receptor antibody positive patients that to generalized myasthenia gravis. So, antibody positive generalized 
acetylcholine receptor antibody positive generalized myasthenia gravis. This is the group who will benefit from thymectomy. So, that means thymectomy is not going to be useful in musk positive uh, myasthenia gravis and zero negative myasthenia gravis in whom all antibodies are negative and in patients with ocular myasthenia gravis. Therefore, in all these groups of patients with myasthenia gravis, thymectomy is best avoided. So, who is going to require thymectomy? Only the acetylcholine receptor antibody positive generalized myasthenia gravis. All other myasthenics will not benefit from thymectomy in the absence of a thymoma. If a thymoma is diagnosed, then it is a different scenario altogether. Even if you are dealing with an ocular myasthenia gravis or a musk positive myasthenia gravis, you will have to do a thymectomy. Now, as I said, it is very, very important to keep in mind the drugs to avoid in all patients with myasthenia gravis. Why is this very important? Because you will be surprised to see that lot of these drugs are commonly used antibiotics. Therefore, they can even be given to a myasthenia gravis patient if you do not no, even when they present with a small trivial symptom like an upper respiratory tract infection, it is very easy to prescribe them these antibiotics if you do not keep this in mind. So, this list of medications is best remembered by this mnemonic. I call it FAQ B camp. What is FAQ? FAQ is frequently asked questions. B camp is like a boot camp. So, what is this FAQ B camp? F stands for fluoroquinolones. A stands for aminoglycosides. Q stands for all quinine derivatives from chloroquine to hydroxychloroquine, all these quinine derivatives. B stands for beta blockers and botulinum toxin. C again stands for checkpoint inhibitors as well as calcium channel blockers. A stands for anesthetics, particularly local anesthetics like xylocaine. M stands for three drugs, magnesium, macrolides and muscle relaxants like atracurium and finally p stands for penicillin now here you will you would have been surprised to see if you didn't know the list already that fluoroquinolones aminoglycosides macrolides three very very strong groups of antibiotics three commonly used groups of antibiotics are going to be counterproductive in patients with myasthenia gravis. So, it is very very important to keep these three drugs in mind. Even if you forget the rest, remember the three antibiotics that should never be used in patients with myasthenia gravis, fluoroquinolones, aminoglycosides and macrolides. So, these three, the family of drugs belonging to these three FAM antibiotics, fluoroquinolone, aminoglycosides and macrolides should not be used in patients with myasthenia gravis. So, just to reiterate the list of drugs which are avoided, F stands for fluoroquinolone, A stands for aminoglycosides, Q stands for quinine derivatives, B stands for beta blockers as well as botulinum toxin, C stands for checkpoint inhibitors and calcium channel blockers, another A stands for anesthetics, local anesthetics, M stands for muscle relaxants, magnesiums and macrolide and P stands for penicillin. Now, having understood the general principles behind management of myasthenia gravis, we saw that two different groups of medications play a very important role. On one end, you had acetylcholine uh, esterase inhibitors and on the other end, you had immunotherapy. Starting from glucocorticoids, we went through mycophenolate, uh, we went through azathioprine, calcineurin inhibitors, the uh, newer monoclonal antibodies, all of that. We also tried to understand the role of thymectomy in myasthenia gravis and we understood about the drugs best avoided in myasthenia gravis. Now, it is time to understand myasthenic crisis and management of myasthenic crisis. Basically, what is meant by myasthenic crisis? So, whenever there is going to be an exacerbation of weakness in myasthenia gravis to such a level that it endangers life, that is what myasthenic crisis is about. So, exacerbation of weakness in myasthenia gravis sufficient enough to endanger life, something that is going to be life threatening, that is when you call it myasthenic crisis. So, basically this translates into ventilatory failure which develops in patients with myasthenia gravis, mainly secondary to weakness of the intercostal muscles and the diaphragm. So, often this myasthenic crisis is triggered by an infection. So, whenever you find your myasthenia gravis patient deteriorating suddenly, always look for infection. Some other triggers are going to be surgery and drugs. So, as I said, inadvertently, when you prescribe one of these drugs that we discussed never to be used in myasthenia gravis, that is that can precipitate myasthenic crisis. And surgery in a patient with myasthenia gravis can precipitate myasthenic crisis. 
pregnancy can also sometimes precipitate myasthenic crisis but the most important trigger is going to be infection therefore how do you treat these patients with myasthenic crisis so myasthenic crisis is nothing but myasthenia gravis with severe weakness and ventilatory failure so how do you treat you treat the trigger what is the trigger commonly an infection so antibiotics are required you treat the ventilatory failure you put the patient on mechanical ventilation and you treat the myasthenia gravis so as we saw earlier these patients are going to require fast acting immunotherapy something like plasma pheresis or ivig now the most important thing to keep in mind whenever we treat a patient with myasthenic crisis is its differential so this close differential is called cholinergic crisis now myasthenic crisis as i said happens because of an exacerbation of the weakness right uh, which leads to ventilatory failure but in contrast what happens in cholinergic crisis here there is going to be excessive stimulation of the muscarinic and the nicotinic receptors by, by the cholinergic so most often this happens in patients who are on high dose uh, cholinesterase inhibitors because of excessive cholinergic effects they end up with cholinergic crisis which can also result in ventilatory failure so how do you manage these patients here the management is just by stopping these cholinergic agents because cholinergic crisis can closely resemble myasthenic crisis it is very important to understand the features which help us in differentiating the two now myasthenic crisis what happens usually there is a trigger as i said infection is the most common trigger but sometimes can be precipitated by surgery or drugs as well but here it basically means that Uh, at that point the patient is being under treated which is resulting in a flare up of the weakness sufficient enough to cause intercostal and diaphragmatic weakness presenting as ventilatory failure that is what it is so here the patients are often on under dosage whereas when you take cholinergic crisis here there is uh, excessive or super saturation of all the muscarinic and the nicotinic receptors because of over dosage so here there is over medication use and over use of medications or an overdosing with the cholinergic agents now with myasthenic crisis one of the most useful tests that helps in quickly differentiating whether we are dealing with myasthenic crisis or cholinergic crisis is called the edrophonium test so when you administer edrophonium at a dose of 2 mg iv star there is going to be a transient improvement in symptoms if you notice this improvement then you are dealing with myasthenic crisis if there is no improvement then you are dealing probably with cholinergic crisis so in those patients administration of atropine will bring about that symptom improvement which was anticipated with edrophonium so remember myasthenic crisis responds to edrophonium which is a anticholinergic so remember myasthenic crisis responds to edrophonium which is a cholinergic agent now cholinergic crisis because this is happening because of excessive cholinergics which are available this is going to respond best to an anticholinergic like atropine now in myasthenic crisis remember everything is increased okay so your heart rate is increased your respiratory rate is going to be there is going to be respiratory distress the pupil is going to be midriatic so the pupil size is going to increase the blood pressure is going to increase so your heart rate increases your bp increases and your pupil size increases that means you are dealing with a dilated pupil what happens in a cholinergic crisis opposite here remember excess of cholinergic so your heart rate decreases bradycardia hypotension bp decreases here there is going to be pinpoint constricted pupils there is going to be meiosis so your pupil size decreases and in myasthenic crisis there is respiratory distress whereas here all these cholinergics are going to cause significant abdominal cramps that is the main problem in patients with cholinergic crisis now secretions are going to be normal in patients with myasthenic crisis whereas that is the only thing which is going to increase in patients with cholinergic crisis now as i said in patients uh, to differentiate between myasthenic and cholinergic crisis at bedside there are two things that you can do number one look at the pupil If the pupil is dilated you are probably dealing with myasthenic crisis give the patient 2 mg iv of edrophonium and you will find that the strength is improved but if you are dealing with a constricted pupil and there is no improvement with edrophonium then this is going to respond to atropine because you are dealing with cholinergic crisis so cholinergic crisis there is no improvement or exacerbation of symptoms with edrophonium 
So remember that. Remember, myasthenic crisis you deal with increase of everything, increased heart rate, increased BP, increase in pupil size. Therefore, you have a dilated pupil. This is because of under dosage, under medication and they respond well to atrophonium. Whereas cholinergic crisis, everything is low. Heart rate is decreased, BP is decreased, pupil size is decreased, there is meiosis. This is because of overuse of medications and here symptoms improve with atropine. Remember excessive secretions, whenever you see excessive secretions during a crisis, very likely you are dealing with cholinergic crisis. So, with that, we have almost come to the end of our discussion on myasthenia gravis and before we wrap off a little bit about the prognosis of myasthenia gravis. In about 20% of patients, that means 1 out of every 5 individuals may go into sustained remission which means at some point of time, we will be able to take them completely off immunotherapy. But this is seen only in up to 1 out of 5 patients. That means for the vast majority of patients with immuno, with myasthenia gravis, they are going to require some form of long term maintenance immunotherapy. However, remember there is no correlation between disease severity and remission. That means in case you have a very severe disease, uh, not necessary that those patients will have a worse prognosis than patients who present with a milder disease at diagnosis. And as I said, remember thymectomy is going to be useful only in patients with acetylcholine receptor antibody positive generalized myasthenia gravis. In patients who are positive for musk antibody, in these patients what is going to significantly improve outcomes, it is going to be rituximab. Rituximab is very effective in the otherwise difficult to treat musk antibody positive myasthenia gravis. Remember the rule of 3 in myasthenia gravis. What is this rule of 3? Three clinical features of myasthenia gravis which you should never forget. Number one, proximal muscle weakness. Number two, ptosis. And number three, exercise fatigability. Three Ds which are important in myasthenia gravis. Number one, deep tendon reflexes are preserved. Number two, drooping eyelid and diplopia. So, two Ds with respect to eye. And number three is going to be a decremental response with repetitive nerve stimulation. Three tests which are very important in myasthenia gravis. Number one is a bedside test which is the ice pack test. So, on exposure to cold, there is lesser depletion of the acetylcholine receptors. Therefore, that, that is going to bring about a transient improvement. And then serologies. Looking for acetylcholine receptor antibodies which are going to be positive in almost 85% of patients with myasthenia gravis and in the remaining Look for the other antibodies like musk antibody and LRP4 antibody. In about 10% of patients, they can be zero negative. All the antibodies can be negative. And number three is going to be repetitive nerve stimulation. So, doing a nerve conduction study with repetitive nerve stimulation tells you if there is a decremental response, then you are most likely looking at myasthenia gravis. So, three important tests, the ice pack test, serologies, look for acetylcholine receptor antibody and number three, repetitive nerve stimulation. As I said earlier, three antibodies to be checked for, acetylcholine receptor antibody, anti-musk and anti-LRP4. Three add-on tests. So, what are the conditions that are most commonly associated with myasthenia gravis? Number one, thymic abnormality could be hyperplasia or Thymoma. Number two, hyperthyroidism. Number three, other autoimmune diseases like SLE or rheumatoid arthritis. So, what are these three add-on tests? Number one, a CT chest to look for a thymus abnormality. Number two, a thyroid function test to look for any thyroid gland abnormality. And number three is going to be other serologies like ANA, RA factor. All this is what we are going to do. Three important presentations of myasthenia gravis. So, either they can present with generalized myasthenia gravis where there is going to be involvement of extraocular muscles in the form of ptosis and also involvement of limb muscles where, which is going to present as a proximal predominant fatigable muscle weakness or patients could present with the ocular myasthenia gravis that is the second form of presentation where patients even after three years from the time of diagnosis they have not developed any limb weakness. Uh, their myasthenia is restricted to the ocular muscles, to the extraocular muscles. So, all they have is ptosis and diplopia, fatigable ptosis. And finally, third presentation, sometimes you will be surprised to see that at the time of diagnosis itself, you could have your patient in myasthenic crisis, which as I said is severe exacerbation of weakness in a myasthenia patient 
uh, which results in ventilatory failure, secondary to diaphragmatic weakness. So, these are the three common presentations. Three important differentials for myasthenia gravis. Remember, if it looks exactly like myasthenia but occurring much earlier in life, uh, in childhood itself, with all the antibodies being negative, very likely you are looking at congenital myasthenic syndrome where there is a genetic defect in one of the components of the neuromuscular junction which is responsible for the deduced efficiency in neuromuscular transmission. Second differential is LEMS. LEMS is lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome. So, here again this is an autoimmune disease but the antibodies are di directed at the presynaptic calcium channels. P by Q voltage gated calcium channels. These calcium channels play an important role in acetylcholine release and therefore, patients develop clinical features similar to myasthenia gravis. But here what happens, you find that there are two things which stand out. Number one, these patients have a weakness which exclusively involves the lower limbs. Extraocular muscle involvement can be seen in up to 70% of patients, but the upper limbs are usually spared. Number two, in these patients, you will find that the deep tendon reflexes are usually absent. And number three, when repetitive nerve stimulation is done at higher rates, they are going to present with an incremental response. So, all these clues should tell you that you are looking at LEMS. Particularly, if you diagnose LEMS in an elderly patient, it could be paraneoplastic. So, always search for a malignancy. And the third important differential is going to be botulism. And botulism is a bacterial infection which you are going to suspect in any patient who presents with a descending flaccid areflexic paralysis whose initial presentation is in the form of a bulbar palsy. So, initially they present with diplopia, ptosis, dysarthria, dysphagia and dysphonia. And finally, the three treatment options that are available for myasthenia gravis. Number one is going to be anticholine estrase agents like pyridostigmin. Number two is going to be immunotherapy. So, usually we are going to start them on glucocorticoids with one other agent which is going to provide long term immunosuppression, something like mycophenolate or azathioprine is what has been widely used. The more recent agents are rituximab and eculizumab. Rituximab particularly useful in musk antibody positive myasthenia gravis and finally thymectomy. Thymectomy for thymoma is useful but even in non-thymomatous patients it is going to be useful if you are dealing with a acetylcholine receptor antibody positive generalized myasthenia gravis patient. So, um, before I wrap up, I just like to give you a final algorithm to myasthenia gravis. So, what are we going to do? Now, I have told you the rule of three and all. So, all these are going to help you in making the right diagnosis of a patient with myasthenia gravis. So, once you have a patient with myasthenia gravis, as I mentioned earlier, you could either be dealing with generalized myasthenia gravis or you could be dealing with an ocular myasthenia gravis or you could have your patient in myasthenic crisis. But as long as you are dealing with generalized myasthenia gravis, then the first drug the patient needs to be on is going to be a cholinesterase inhibitor like pyridostigmin. Step number two, you are going to evaluate the patient for thymectomy. Now, this is particularly important in which subgroup of patient, as I said, in all acetylcholine receptor antibody positive, generalized myasthenia gravis patients or in patients with thymoma. These are the two subsets of patients who will definitely require thymectomy. Now, if they require thymectomy, you will have to do a forced vital capacity because if it is low, these patients are going to require immunotherapy directly with plasmapheresis or IVIG prior to thymectomy. However, if you are not planning thymectomy or if you are planning a thymectomy but the FVC is not low, then we usually resort to a traditional immunosuppression with glucocorticoids and one of the other two widely used agents like mycophenolate or azathioprine. So, as I have been mentioning in patients who are positive for musk antibody, rituximab seems to be the drug of choice. Now, how do we manage ocular myasthenia gravis? Ocular myasthenia gravis also requires treatment with acetylcholine esterase inhibitors and immunotherapy in the form of glucocorticoids and additional immunosuppression with mycophenolate or azathioprine. And how do we manage myasthenic crisis? In myasthenic crisis, remember, first and foremost, treat the infection, treat the trigger with antibiotic. Number two, treat the ventilatory failure. So, offer adequate ventilatory support to the patient in the form of mechanical ventilation and number three, we will have to treat the myasthenia gravis with immunotherapy. 
what is preferred here plasmapheresis and ivig are the preferred modes of immunotherapy in patients with myasthenic crisis so as to expedite the recovery and with this we've come to the end of our discussion on myasthenia gravis thank you i hope this has been helpful this is dr aditi for raw online